creating a culture of love. As a society, we're pushing that it's supposed to happen like this, right? Because that's what we see in the illusion of social media is that you decided you wanted to start this dream yesterday and today you already achieved it. And it's like, that's not true. Like mm -hmm. I'm in my thirties now and it's taken me this long to get to this point and I'm not finished, mm -hmm. you know? Um, like things that are great take time. Constance. Yes, hi. Thank you for coming into the studio today. <laughs> yeah. I uh, forgot kind of what the LA traffic was like since I haven't been here in so long. It happens. Yeah. Well, especially here, like Santa Monica area, it's bad. But So the, this is what I was telling the guys <laughs> yesterday. Uh, 5.1 miles on my navigation, 47 minutes. Yeah. I was going to say an hour. That 47 minutes was being generous, I feel like. Mm -hmm. But I feel like I could run faster to some of these places. Obviously, I'll get there really exhausted and sweaty. But Yeah. When I lived in L.A., I definitely had many times where I was like, I could just park right here and walk past all these cars. Mm -hmm. But yeah, no, it was, it was nice. So today, not too bad. Well, thank you for braving traffic. <laughs> so to tell us about yourself. Share who you are and i'm just really curious you know how did you get into car i love cars like to me it's one of my my passions and i have a dream to have like a 10 car garage i don't need a big house but i want a 10 car garage with the whole slew of everything yeah yeah you know and it's like i want an apache a 55 cameo i've got the 63 and a 70 and that's kind of the four trucks that i want and move on from there okay okay yeah so. i kind of like i feel that my whole goal is to eventually just have like a farm of mustangs just like a big old like warehouse and then like some out in the field out there that i'll i'll get to you know project ones mm. but yeah no i mean i've been into cars my entire life my Dad was a mechanic and he raced all the LACR scene growing up. So my whole family, we just grew up around it and mm -hmm. going to the racetrack every weekend. And I always thought I was going to be a race car driver was mm. kind of my <laughs> first uh, aspiration. Um, but I kind of deviated more into building and I just really grew passionate about that. And the more I did, the more I felt like that was kind of more my calling mm -hmm. than the racing side. But yeah, I mean, when it comes to cars, I could I could go on all day. <laughs> yeah. um, but I just love the whole I love everything about building, everything about driving, everything about the community too. just like being an auto enthusiast and like what that brings to people in their lives and like how valuable that is. Mm -hmm. I think it, it really does help a lot of people, uh, especially in today's world where it's a struggle out there, you know, it's yeah. really tough. So if you can find something that you're passionate about that just brings you a little joy, then mm -hmm. that's all that matters. A nice hobby, an outlet, a yeah. passion, a second career choice, whatever <laughs> it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And just being, I mean, you talk about LA traffic, we live in our cars. Yeah. So, you know, what we drive, some some people don't care about cars. I don't understand how you can't care about cars. But to me, it's like, no, I love it. It's everything. And like, these are the certain cars I want to drive or have. Well, like, I don't know. I feel like with my Mustang, it's such a part of who I am. Mm. It's been to all of my life's biggest moments. It's taken me all the places that I needed to go that were really life changing for me. You know, I've, I've laughed in my car, I've cried in my car. I mean, I've really, it's been my rock the whole time. So I could never imagine not caring about it as passionately as I do. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, even in LA, I mean, I drove my car as my daily car every day, 405 traffic. And it just, I don't know, made it not so bad, I guess. Yeah, right. It's like I'm in my little secret bubble here. And I know, <laughs> yeah. You know, at least it's my cool thing. It's yeah, yeah. I'm in here. It's me and her, me and him, whatever you. Did you name the Mustang? Uh, Baby Stang. Baby Stang. Yeah, yeah. So that's like uh, my marriage, I guess, till death do us part, me mm. and that Mustang. <laughs> um, I've had it 17 years now. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. So. It's been a journey, the two of us, for sure. And and I just feel like I was saying, like, it's such a part of me, but it's it's my brand. It's, you know, my career. It's it's represent 
like representing me as a person. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've gone through ups and downs. I've changed. I've grown. And my car does too. I mean, every time I'm in a new stage of my life, it changes colors, you know? Mm. And, and I like that. I like that it's very reflective of like where I am in my life. That's a good, like a barometer of mm -hmm. the story and the evolution of Constance. Yeah, yeah. So right now it's rose gold. So it's very Ooh. in its feminine moment. <laughs> I need to see some photos of that later. Yeah, yeah. It's very uh, unique. <laughs> and uh, so, so you grew up, your family was big into car culture and all that. But what was it about it specifically? Is it working with your hands? Is the fact that you're problem solving? Is it designing and tricking them out and lowering them what is it about the car itself or bonding is it something that you did with your dad your family what's what's the story that's the real connecting for thread i mean obviously growing up in a family that does it you naturally gravitate towards you know being in that industry and liking the things in that industry i think i always really had a fascination with taking things apart and putting them back together mm -hmm. and i just really applied that to cars um I did also just really love just the whole sense of like being at the racetrack, like loud cars and burnouts and donuts and all the things. But I think as I got into like my teenage years, I started to realize that there was a lot of people that I knew that were really passionate about cars and didn't really have the capability to build them, mm -hmm. um, whether it was financial based or skill based or whatever it was. And... I just really started to have this passion of, well, what can I do to where those people can have the same experience that I have with my car, mm. you know? And so my career kind of took a little turn to being more about that. What can I do? How many cars can I build for people that are just as passionate about it, but they're, they're right out of reach for whatever reason. Yeah. So that kind of started really fueling like, you're not just building to make money. You're not just building because it's a job. You know, I'm not just a mechanic. I'm trying to build dreams for other people. Mm. And that way they can experience everything that I've experienced with babysitting. So that's kind of where I've taken it from there. And it's just grown exponentially. <laughs> mm -hmm. No, because it's kind of cool because there's a lot of people that love cars. But you couldn't even tell them barely where the gas tank is. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, and I don't fault anyone for that, you know. Um, but if I can help them and and get them into that position, then by all means, you know. Um, it, it really brings me the most joy to deliver a car to a client that's been, like, waiting for it. It's their everything. They call every day, you know, wanting updates and everything. Not because they're, like, being a customer about it. They're, like... They just love that car mm -hmm. so much, you know, and there's nothing better than getting to deliver a car to someone and just seeing that look in their eyes of like, that's really everything for them, you know, like, and I feel that too. Mm -hmm. And I know the feeling because I have the 63 C10 and my buddy that was doing the build, I'm always like, is it ready yet? Yeah. Is it ready yet? Like, <laughs> I just want to drive it. Yeah. Like, yeah. Why is it taking so long? He's like, well, we got a few projects going on. Like, you're not the only one. Yeah. But like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they because I know you want to get it done too and you want to yeah. get it out there, but it's also about not, not rushing the process and what if something comes up? Yeah, or... yeah, no, always like you know, art takes time, mm -hmm. right? And to me, cars are art, so it's like it takes time, but I totally get like all of my clients have my personal cell phone, they call whenever they need to call. I totally get it, like, I'm definitely not one of those shop owners that's like. Oh, please leave me alone. Mm -hmm. Like I get it. And I'm excited. They're excited. Like sometimes I'm like, yep. Okay. Like we're not there yet. Like we just got to slow the roll a little mm -hmm. bit, but like I enjoy their passion, you know, and I would never want to like fizzle that in any way. Yeah. So is the Mustang your favorite platform to work on or is there multiple? Um, so I grew up in a Chevy family. Ooh, so <laughs> I, I love Chevy. I'm a Chevy guy. <laughs> um, and I don't know what happened, but uh, everyone in my family had Chevys and I just really wanted a Mustang. Mm. Um, and I really, I was very determined to get the first Mustang. It had to be a 64 and a half because I'm a very mm -hmm. stubborn, picky person. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't know. I just, I always really loved that particular car. And 
I guess like the better I got at working on my own car, the more skilled I became at Mustangs in general. And people just started kind of knowing that that's what I was really good at. Mm -hmm. And so I just started getting one Mustang, two Mustang, three Mustang. And like it just went on from there to where now people know like if they have a Mustang, I'm the person to go to. Mm -hmm. But I do let other things in the shop as well like fiona blue i like, mean come yeah, on. yeah even chevys you know <laughs> so you work in let's just call it it's a man's world right it's more masculine it's more how is that showing up in that space and like owning your power because it can probably get a little i know some people just when i talk about some people are like oh i work in this space but it's like it's all men and yeah. it, it could be a whole nother world but if you really own like your powerful presence i could tell because just by the energy that you came in here but how was that navigating it is it um i mean i think i would be lying to say like it's always like i'm coming in super strong and feeling super confident mm -hmm. i think that that's kind of what people like to say about themselves um i think i am a really confident person but i think that's come with age and time mm -hmm. i think when i started my career i definitely felt the intimidation factor of like well i'm just a girl you know, like mm -hmm. trying to do this, this stuff that I love, but it's in a field where there's nobody really like me doing it. Yeah. Um, and I think what changed for me with that was just realizing like, well, why? There's not really a reason that I can't be just as good as the guys mm -hmm. are at it. Like there's nothing that's stopping me from turning a wrench the same way. Yeah. And once that started clicking in my mind of like, it's not different. So now I just go into everything like that. And I think that's the confidence part mm -hmm. of it. And I think like, obviously there's struggles still, like it's still very heavily male dominated, mm -hmm. um, even though there's so many like amazing females in the industry now. Um, I think there is obviously still that kind of heavy one-sidedness, mm -hmm. but I think it's getting better. And I think also just um, more people going into it and realizing they don't have to conform to a little box of i mean like i get it all the time people go well you don't look like a mechanic yeah i go well what does a mechanic look like great question like, right? you know because i know what you're thinking right you're thinking of this very particular guy covered in grease like beard belly the whole thing Tattoos, whatever it is yeah but i'm like but if you saw a clean cut guy working on a ferrari you wouldn't think twice about it Mm -hmm. So what's the difference, you mm -hmm. know? So I think like the more people start to kind of realize those things, the better it's getting. Mm -hmm. And I think the more of us that come out as not conforming to anything and showing, you know, what we can do and how it's just as good, if not better, the more other people and other women get into the industry and say, yeah. you know what, I can do it too. Um, so I think it's just about seeing someone relatable. Um, I think my dad also raised me not to, um, take nonsense, I will say in the most PG way. Mm -hmm. um, so I did have a really strong support system in the sense of my dad has never felt like I should be treated any different. Mm -hmm. I mean, I worked for him for a small portion of time when I was in high school and he actually fired me. Uh, <laughs> so there's no, like, he never treated me different. So I go into situations like that. I'm not any different than the guys. I'm going to come in here. I'm going to do my job. I'm going to do it mm -hmm. to the best of my capabilities. And there's nothing like I shouldn't be treated any different or looked upon mm -hmm. any different just because I look like this. Yeah. You know? And that's the hard part, right? That's the construct of everything. What does an artist look like? Yeah. What is a mechanic look like a customizer whatever field we're in you know for the longest time it's like even till we, we don't have a female president yet but a president's a man but yeah. why so these constructs and these boxes that we're put in and one of the things that intrigued me about wanting to have a conversation with you also is like you're in this male dominated space but you're showing up as you and you're not letting these boxes define you yeah i mean i definitely um feel the pressure sometimes. I mean, there's definitely times where I know like I got looked over or something like that because I don't fit that cookie cutter. Mm -hmm. Even as a female mechanic, I don't fit the cookie cutter. Mm -hmm. um, and can that be sometimes disappointing? Absolutely. Like I'm a 
human. I have emotions, you know, like it hurts sometimes. Mm -hmm. But then, like I said, I just remember, well, the stuff I do is great. I have the best intention that I have with it. Mm -hmm. And I'm happy with myself. And that's way more important than this one time I got overlooked because someone couldn't see my value. Yeah. Then that's good. I mean, imagine, let's just talk to the youth. All the little girls coming up now. One day I may have a daughter. I have a son now. One day I may have a daughter. It's like, how can we start showing up to empower everyone? Yeah. Regardless of what we are and what we look like. Yeah. And that's the part of choosing love and, and looking at the human instead of however we want to like start defining it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think like, especially like with the youth and everything, it's a weird world right now. Like I, I do feel like a little bad for them because it's, it's not the same as Mm -hmm. when we were younger and everything. So they deal with so many other struggles that I didn't deal with growing up in the industry of like the social media stuff, like everything, like it drives me crazy how now it's like, well, well, where's the video of you doing this? It's like, well, I have a job. I'm working. Like mm-hmm. this is a client is paying for these hours. They're not paying me to sit here on my phone taking selfies and like recording a video to yeah. prove to Joe Schmo in the middle of the country what I'm doing. But that's the pressure that these kids feel. It's mm-hmm. like if they if they're not having a ton of followers or they're not giving off this image of being super successful right out the gate, like like they're in this world of instant gratification, you have to show every, everybody how good you're doing and everybody what you have mm-hmm. and everybody what you can do instead of just doing. Mm. Just do it. Just do it for yourself. If no one sees it, nobody sees it. Mm-hmm. That's fine. Did you do what you wanted to do and it made you happy and it made the people around you happy? Great. That's all that matters. Mm-hmm. And I feel bad that they have this pressure that is so unnecessary and if i could say anything to anyone in any career like any youth trying to go into anything is just try to block that out because it actually doesn't matter Mm. like it's like we get told in high school right that we feel like something's the end of the world but everyone out of high school tells us that's not going to affect your life in a couple years Mm -hmm. like it's not as big of a deal as you feel like it is right now Mm -hmm. and it's the same with all these pressures nobody nothing you do is really going to be affected by the fact that you didn't post today Mm. that is a real struggle and honestly if we look at it what we do behind closed doors when nobody's looking is what actually gets us to that one moment that everyone sees like oh wow you did that or you did this accomplishment or you got this accolade or you got but yeah it's everything you did behind the scenes to get to that point Well, and just the fact that that behind the scenes time, I feel like as a society, we're pushing that it's supposed to happen like this, right? Because that's what we see in the illusion of social media is that you decided you wanted to start this dream yesterday and today you already achieved it. And it's like, that's not true. Like Mm -hmm. I'm in my 30s now and it's taken me this long to get to this point and I'm not finished, Mm -hmm. you know, Um, like Things that are great take time. You know, a a cake that's delicious takes an hour in the oven, not five minutes. Mm -hmm. But it's worth the hour, you know? So it's like just I feel like we need to be presenting it more of like, okay, you want this goal, just know it's going to take work. And that that doesn't mean it's going to happen overnight. If Mm -hmm. it does, great. Like, awesome. But if it doesn't, you didn't fail. Mm -hmm. No. So examples are overnight. Everyone thinks we're all overnight successes now, Mm -hmm. right? So what was the transition to get to TV and the show? How has that, how is that realistic to what you're doing in your day to day? Um, helped you grow as a practice. And then probably someone just started watching the show and they're like, wow, boom, this just happened. She's an overnight success. But you're like, no, I've been doing this since I was a kid with my family. Yeah. Yeah. Like I, I had no intention of being on TV. That was never like a Mm -hmm. thing I thought I was going to be doing. Um, No, I was just, I was passionate about cars. I was building, I was working. And I was always striving to kind of have my own shop. I have worked in so many shops and helped so many other people with their dreams. Mm -hmm. And I always knew that's where I wanted to go with it because I knew that I just cared a little bit differently. The clients, my clients, they're like my family. Like I wanted to be able to give them exactly what I wanted to give them, you know? Um, 
And I was building and building and building. And then I moved to LA and uh, I started modeling because that's what you do in LA. And I figured that's car part money, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it just got me really well connected. And it got me connected actually to a lot of people in the automotive industry mm. in LA as well. And so I was working even more for even more shops. And then one day, one of the shops that I was working with got offered a TV show. And the next thing I knew, I was on TV building, mm. which was very uh, interesting. Um, it, it's definitely different building on TV, just in the sense of like, uh, you're not used to having someone over your shoulder all the time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so that was, it was a kind of a transition to get used to doing that. Um, and I honestly didn't think it was going to go anywhere because mm -hmm. there's a million automotive TV shows. And it, for me, I was just happy working. Um, and here we are. We're now going to air our fifth season. Wow. So it's pretty crazy, um, but I'm super grateful for it. I mean, it's definitely um, allowed me to share my platform um, and grow my platform and really show people, you know, what I can do, but also, again, what I could do for them. Mm -hmm. um, and it's allowed a lot of people to connect to me that maybe wouldn't have got to uh, without those kind of things happening. Mm -hmm. So, but... Like I said, I'm not, I definitely don't feel like I'm done. Um, there's a lot of Mustangs out there that still need saving. So mm -hmm. you're just getting started. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, you know, like I just wish like more younger people realize that like it doesn't need to be that overnight. Like I said, that took mm -hmm. years um, and years of trial and error too. Sometimes it doesn't work out. You think you're going to do one thing and it doesn't go that way, or you really wanted this goal and, and it doesn't work out and you have to pick up the pieces and keep going, you mm -hmm. know? Um, it's not all what we see on like social media. Yeah, I know. And that, that last line, right? That's, that's exactly is what it is. You know, sometimes I speak to junior high or high school kids and I remember a while ago and I share this story because uh, some of my murals are anything can happen. Anything can be, you are beautiful. You belong here. Just moments and messages to really inspire you that like we are enough and we are here. And I showed the You Are Beautiful mirror and I asked the kid, so like, do you guys feel beautiful right now? And one little girl's like, no. And I yeah. said, well, what's keeping you from feeling beautiful? And she's like, well, I'm not Kim Kardashian. You know, and this isn't to say anything bad about Kim at all. It's just the, how is it that the world is being framed and society is being framed and social media now that is, you know, confusing kids or causing conflictions or like, well, I'm not enough because I'm not her. Yeah, I think that um, like in our society today, there's this, well, again, if you're if you don't fit into this box, well, that's wrong. It's not. That's that box. Mm -hmm. And that box is totally fine. If you are that box, great. If you're not, that's fine, too. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's just more about showing that there are all these other boxes that you can be. You can also make your own box. Mm -hmm. That's totally fine, too. Um, and I think that's just more of people getting... I feel like I'm like that old person that's so anti-social media. But um, that's more like go outside, talk to real people, experience real things, put your phone down sometimes. Like, I mean, like I have a, a big following on social media. I do post, but in the big picture, I don't really. There's so many times where I'll be like, wow, it's been like three weeks and I just didn't even go on Instagram mm -hmm. <laughs> um, because I'm just living my life and doing my things. And I think like that's really important for people to remember that like there's a whole world out there mm -hmm. that's beautiful, that will show you experiences and teach you who you are mm -hmm. and the more you learn who you are the less you're going to feel that pressure of well i'm not this so i'm not beautiful or i'm not this so i'm not successful mm -hmm. or whatever it is the more you learn about yourself out there in the real world doing real things with people that are actually beneficial to your life the more you're going to realize that that box is for that person and your box is something else mm -hmm. no no well said and 
you know, just to say, you have a big presence, you have a big following, and some people stress out, oh, I have this presence, I have to post every day, or I have to put it out there every day. And then you've got other people that are like, post 10 times a day, 100 times a day, but just post real authentic stuff. It's, yeah. the, it's the overthinking and the over-editing and the face-tuning, and that's where I get a little irked. Like, wow, you are you can edit videos of yourself now. You can nip and tuck everything on yeah, an app. Yeah, yeah. But it's when crazy. you show up in real life, you're still not that like. I get worried about that kind of stuff because, like, I'll even like sometimes if it's like a professional photo shoot where like I don't have control of the image, I'll be like, I really hope they don't do it, like anything crazy because mm -hmm. I do do so many in person things that I'm like, I don't want to be that person that shows up and they're like, Who are you? Like, I want people to be like, Oh no, like that's Constance for yeah, sure. Yeah, you, you want to be what you want to be. You are yeah. everywhere. <laughs> Um, and like, I totally get it. Like there's definitely pressure to appear a certain way. And, and I get just like wanting to appear a certain way for yourself. And I think that kind of goes under the radar sometimes is people think, well, oh, they're, somebody's dressing a certain way for somebody else, or they want to look this way to, you know, for the opposite sex or whatever it is. And it's like, well, no, I think maybe there's that, but I think there's also people that are like, like me, I I like to have my makeup done. You won't see me in the shop without my makeup done mm -hmm. ever. That's because that's what I like and it makes me happy. Mm -hmm. And that's just me and I don't do it for anyone else. Mm -hmm. So I think it's totally okay to do things for yourself. I think that when you start to manipulate yourself so far that it's not you mm -hmm. and you're not doing it because of your own reasons, that's like the big problem yeah. is whatever you're doing, make sure you're doing it for just you. Um, yeah. Whether that's the way you're dressing or dyeing your hair a certain color or, you know, using a filter on Instagram. Like, yep, there's some cute mm -hmm. ones out there. I use them sometimes, little cat ears or something. Like, it's fun to mess around with it, but just remember who you are for yourself, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and I think, like, we don't stress that enough. It's this constant just, like, you have to be this way. And if you're not this way, then it's not okay. No. Yeah. I mean, th and those are struggles I've dealt with, you know, in my early twenties, I was in real estate. I did really well, but I was under the impression that success is defined by what I have, what I could buy, what I could afford, what can I show and how much money I have. Yeah. You know, now it's completely different because then I lost it all. I went bankrupt. I had to start over. I had to start fresh. And I'm like, I'm still me without all these things. Hmm, yeah. Interesting. <laughs> Well, and it's really interesting you had that kind of like all the way at the top and then all the way at the bottom. And yet here you are doing really well, mm -hmm. happy. Like I think people don't talk about that enough either mm -hmm. of like no one talks about the failure part because that's scary and that's bad. But it's like some of the most successful people failed multiple times. Oh, yeah. And they're doing just fine. You know, and I think that's something like we don't see enough of like people being really transparent with that kind of stuff of like, no, I, I failed or I messed up or, you know, I was incorrect in this and I'm correcting it and making it better. Mm -hmm. um, like cancel culture stuff is so crazy right now to oh, me. Yeah. And like it's crazy because I feel like it's gone about in such a not correct way of like we want to cancel people for making genuine human error. And it's yes. like, it, that's only because now everyone's on big platforms and in front of everybody. Mm -hmm. But it's like, it, it was a human error. Like, you're supposed to learn and grow from that. And like, we're supposed to make mistakes and we're supposed to fail and we're supposed to fall down and get back up, you know, without everyone pushing us while we're down. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's like really dangerous a little bit where like cancel culture is going with that kind of stuff no i agree and with that also it's people going back 10 15 years on some some tweet that was said when twitter first came out and this person was a completely different person yeah and we look at and say oh he she was that i'm like why don't we look at how this person has grown evolved and become a better human yeah or showed up different like they're like this now they were like that. That's not the same person. Yeah, and I totally understand, you know, um, people that are just bad people, not willing to grow, not mm -hmm. willing to change, are purposely out here trying to hurt other people. That I get, right? What I don't get is, like you said, somebody doing something that maybe they 
didn't know what they were saying. They genuinely weren't meaning to hurt anyone. They've learned from it, whatever it is. If, if a child stole a piece of candy at a grocery store, because they don't know, they're a kid, they just walk out with it, right? You're not going to be like, this kid is canceled forever. <laughs> like no yeah. jobs for them, no friends for them. They can never not be this five-year-old that walked out with a lollipop. That is them forever. Mm -hmm. That would be crazy. We wouldn't do that. So why do we do it to adults? You're allowed to make mistakes. I'm not saying that they're all, some are not worse than others. Um, and like I said, some people do have bad intentions and those are bad people. Mm -hmm. But I think generally speaking, there are a lot of people that just make regular mistakes and they are so harshly treated. And instead of someone coming in and going, hey, let me educate you on why that hurt people or why that's not you know, what you should be doing or how that affects others. That's what you should be doing is having a conversation. Yeah, I agree. And then looking at the whole picture and, and what's happening. So we're humans. We're supposed to make mistakes. We're allowed to make mistakes. And that's how we learn. Yeah. So we're just automatically just canceling them, removing them. How are they going to learn? No, they're just going to seclude back in to that. Mm -hmm. And now nothing better came in that situation at all. Mm -hmm. Like, and I, and I think it's crazy too, because it makes me think, well, have you never made a mistake? Because that's pretty wild to mm -hmm. me. Like I've made tons of mistakes in my life. I've done things as a teenager. I would never do now in my thirties, you know, like, um, and, and not anything bad, but just stuff, you know, you're just being a dumb hooligan kid in your race mm -hmm. car, you know? Um, you know, there's just stuff I would never do now, but I had to learn that it wasn't right and learn my lesson and learn how I was, my actions were affecting other people. Um, you know, and I'm much more educated about certain things now that I get it and I'm a better person. And it's like, that's that's what we should be doing mm -hmm. is, is evolving into being better people. Yeah. So... Where does I just I keep thinking about this question. I want to ask you. <laughs> what how can we use cars as a metaphor for life, right? What are some lessons you've learned from working on a car, whether it's problems or troubleshooting or something that's consistently constant that we can apply to life as lessons? I think my biggest lesson with cars is commitment. Mm. I think that um especially when it comes to like classic cars, right? I think uh in a perfect world, we want everything to work out all the time and never have any struggles or anything like that, right? Um, but that's not real. And I think that a lot of people have a really hard time dealing with uh, staying committed to something when it's not going exactly the way that they mm -hmm. want it to. And I think with cars, you know, I, like I said, I've had my car 17 years. Even as a great mechanic, it has left me on the side of the road from time to time mm -hmm. because there's just things that happen and cars are cranky and they want to do their own thing. They're machines at the end of the day. Parts are going to fail. Something's going to go wrong. And it's that commitment of not abandoning my baby, mm -hmm. you know, um, I'm not going to just walk out on my car because it left me on the side of the road one time. You know, it could be raining and I'm out there trying to make it happen like it's a commitment I'm committed to this car and and having it you know stay nice and taking care of it and nurturing it and I think that people need to do that with other aspects of their life too um not just taking the easy bailout route as soon as it's not perfect mm. um because I do see that a lot and I even see it in people like trying to go into the industry um I get so many messages and it breaks my heart actually um from women that say well i wanted to go into automotive i wanted to take shop class in high school and i didn't because it was really intimidating or mm. you know boys told me that i couldn't do it or whatever so they immediately bailed on the idea and just went off to do something else mm -hmm. and it makes me sad because Maybe they would have had a really successful career in automotive. Maybe they wouldn't have. Maybe in a couple of years they would have said, hey, I don't like this as much mm -hmm. as I thought I would. And that's okay. But they didn't even try mm -hmm. because there's no commitment to I'm going to stick this through till the end and see where it goes and see where it takes me. Um, even with the ups and downs, um, 
I just think that's something you can apply to like many aspects mm -hmm. of your life is staying committed to something, seeing it through. Like I said, of course, when the end is the end, I totally get that. But I think people jump ship a lot earlier than they should. No, I agree. When it gets hard, we're out. Like, yeah. Marriage is one of the greatest examples of that. Mm -hmm. Gets tough, divorce, we're out. Yeah. And that rate is getting higher and higher and higher. The percentages of failed marriages because we don't want to do the work or relationships or anything in general. Businesses. Yeah. yeah no, I, I, I was married. Divorced now. Mm. Um, and a lot of people I see around me that are getting divorced. I tell them, I'm like, but you haven't like, obviously, there's so many reasons to get divorced. Bad situations. Great. Get mm -hmm. out as soon as you can. But then I see a lot of people that they're just, oh, well, it's a little rough. Oh, this one thing kind of inconvenienced me and it's not, you know, sunshine and rainbows and perfect, like on Pinterest or something. Mm -hmm. And they want to bail out. And I'm like, but you didn't even try. Mm -hmm. Like you made a commitment to this person. You loved them enough to commit to that sole person that you chose. Yeah. This is not your family or anything. And like, I can say that personally from going through a divorce, like, uh, you know, my ex and I obviously got divorced for certain reasons, but we still tried mm. and tried to use all the avenues that we could. And I think a lot of people just don't even, they're just like, but I could just sign the papers and like go on to my life and like go out this weekend and whatever. And it's like, that's how you're going to treat everything then. Yeah. And, and you're never going to have something that's like substantial because you can't commit to working through that. Sometimes it, you're going to have to bend a little, you know, I think people today are really stuck on this. It's all about me thing. And you are first a hundred percent. That's fine. But not so much that it is like detrimental to all the relationships mm. around you or the people around you. There is something to having human compassion and empathy and being able to be flexible mm -hmm. or compromising. And I think people really misconstrue those things with, well, then I'm not thinking of myself. I can still think of myself and compromise in a situation. Mm -hmm. I can still think of myself and be sympathetic. Um, you know, like with my divorce, I thought of myself and what was best for me. That didn't mean I wasn't sympathetic to the situation as a whole or my ex or what he was going through. Mm -hmm. um, so I think people, they, they don't understand that you could do both things at the same time. It's one or the other, um, which is not actually the case. No, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We have the opportunity to see it all, play it all through. And and I know what you're saying by all about me. It's self-love and selfishness and all that is very important. It's selfishness because we love ourselves. Yeah. Not because it's my way or the highway and nothing else works. Yeah. Right. And that's what we're saying by compromise. Compromise is about like meeting in the middle. It's not sacrificing or being a martyr or being a punching bag. It's like, okay, I could see you there. Let's meet here. Let's compromise. And that works in business. That works in everything. That yeah. I think um, a lot of people don't realize they think if they compromise, they're giving up everything that they mm -hmm. want. But a lot of times, like what you want and what the other person wants, can coexist um but we just never actually like try to make that happen mm -hmm. so then again you just bail out and there's no commitment right but it's like well maybe if you just talked about it for a second you would realize like oh well i can give them all these things and still be completely selfish mm -hmm. self-love all the things and still have everything i need and want while they also can have that mm -hmm. and i think we just have a really hard time seeing that it's okay to like everybody can benefit everybody can enjoy mm -hmm. everyone can you know get something out of the deal in a sense like i think we forget that a lot yeah it's both and instead of either or yeah exactly it's not an ultimatum mm -hmm. you know, and we're all living this together yeah um no no that, and that's well said because we can apply these things to everything Oh, yeah. Relationships, business, everything. I mean, there's definitely times where and, and even building cars, it's like I have clients that want A, B, C, D, E, and they can only afford A and B, you know, and it's like, OK, well, how do we what's the overall goal? How can we get there with what you can do? You know, what can I help you get that's more logical? Maybe this makes more sense. Maybe we can come back to doing this. You know, how can I? do everything that I can to get you everything you want 
within the means that you have instead of just being like, nope, we can't do it. Mm-hmm. And it's like, what's essential? What's a plan? Let's build mm-hmm. into it. Mm-hmm. And we, we like each other. I like your car. I want to work on it. You know, and, or in my case, they're like, I would love a mural, but I can't afford it. Oh, I would love a painting, but I can't afford it. So let's get a print. Yeah. And then it's like, well, the limited edition prints, yeah, I can't afford that. Well, how about a open edition print or a t-shirt? Or like you yeah. start, let's if we start looking at solutions and problem solving, and be more malleable in yeah. that sense and, and forgiving and patient, I think that's a good thing. Because we'll take my truck, for example. I know what all I want on there, but I'm <laughs> like, I saved up for the power plant, the motor yeah. and the wiring and the electrical and the lights, like the stuff that had to be done first. Like, what would it done me any well if I would have airbagged it, done audio, but the thing still has a motor that barely runs? Yeah, yeah. And I think sometimes people think um, like... You have to have it all at once. And it's like, but you don't. It's like um, people that want to move into their dream house, right? I get it. I have a dream house that I want, but maybe you just move into a home for now. Maybe you move into a home Mm -hmm. with your family and take care of them and you work towards that Mm -hmm. dream house or you work towards making that home what you dream for it to be instead of just waiting forever for that dream house you know it's like that's what makes it feel even more in the distance Mm -hmm. is what i'm not going to do anything until i get everything that i want it's like but you could be enjoying Mm -hmm. these other things right now while you're still working towards that other goal you know um and i think more people need to see that of like live like you're living right now enjoy the things you can Mm -hmm. do and the things you can have and still work towards those things but maybe you don't get the whole basket at once you know Mm -hmm. and i'll I'll add a a spin on that because one reason why i also partition we're just using the truck as an example again i could have just had my buddy do it all yeah but then i would have got the truck back and like well what do i do now it's complete like and then there's there could also be a letdown because you got it all and then you're done. Mm-hmm. In this case, it's like, oh, we're working on it now. Oh, we're doing more, saving up, doing another thing. So you're constantly working on evolving. Yeah. So like the house, like I want the dream house right here where I live now. It's a lot of money. I don't have that money yet. But I can either save up and wait for that or just know I got to go make more money. It's in my control. And just how long do I want to wait? But I also don't want to compromise and go live in like Timbuktu because, oh, I could afford it out here. And I'm, I don't know, Rancho Cucamonga. Not to say anything bad about (laughs) that place, but it's just what came to mind. Yeah. You know? Yeah. No, I definitely don't believe in um, sacrificing the things you want. I think maybe just going about getting them in a different way. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people, they, they have one like one road of getting to the end goal instead of realizing it's it's like a city there's many ways to get to one location Mm -hmm. right so instead of sticking on that one road just realize you could make a left and a right and here and here and end up still at that same goal so i think it's more that of just like realizing you can take a lot of different paths to get somewhere Mm -hmm. and maybe some of those paths are more enjoyable than others for the time being yeah and some will be tough some will be tricky some will be a little Tur- turny but it's gonna be it's gonna get you there yeah exactly no this is great no i'm enjoying <laughs> like it's funny because we could have we could have a conversation you don't know where it's gonna go and we're just talking about things that apply yeah and uh just apply to everything and to me again i love cars so much that it's just a good metaphor for me yeah and uh just moving throughout life so you put the navigation you could even have the navigation in the map but have the wrong address, Mm -hmm. the wrong destination. And just because you get there doesn't mean you can't do a U-turn or turn left or turn right. Yeah, yeah. I feel like um, somebody told me this one time of like, you could be the perfect package, but at the wrong address. And it was right when I was going through my divorce and everything. And I really took that to heart because it helped me a lot personally realize Mm -hmm. like I, I wasn't not good enough. Um, I didn't fail. Mm-hmm. There was nothing wrong with me just because this situation didn't work out. It just wasn't where I was meant to be. Yeah. Um, and I think a lot of people should maybe take that message to heart too and, and need it because I do think that they put pressure on themselves of like, 
well, if I didn't get to my dream mm-hmm. house on this one road, well, there's something wrong with me. There's mm-hmm. something I did not correct. And it's like, no, like maybe that's just, you got to go a different way, you know, or you're meant to be somewhere else. Um, or maybe that dream house that you thought you wanted, like you were saying earlier, maybe you get everything you want and it's not everything you thought it was exactly. going to be. Um, so I think people really have to remember, like, you may think that this is this is it, but maybe life has something else for you that's even better. Mm-hmm. Totally. Yeah. And also th- realizing that life's going to guide us, but we've got to work on ourselves enough to realize that we can receive all these things because sometimes we're ignoring the holes inside of us and we go try to get something to fill the hole. Yeah. Right. That dream house, the car, the this, the that. And all of a sudden we have it and there's still a letdown because we're still not good inside. Yeah, yeah. I definitely, um, I think we all do that with something. I mean, I've felt that way even where it's like, oh, well, if I'm not, you know, showing this car at this show or, you know, if I, if every car that I put out is in a $100,000 car, then, then I'm not showing enough of what I can do. Mm-hmm. And it took me a long time to kind of navigate the fact that I – was compensating for feeling like I needed to compete with other people. Mm. Um, I have to have, you know, the car at the show with the most expensive paint job on it to be valued. Um, And I just had to realize like that wasn't what other people necessarily were making me feel like. I was just making myself feel that way Mm. from my own insecurities. And the more confident I got in myself, the less I felt like I needed to do that. Mm. Where I was like, well, I could. I'm totally capable of building, you know, a beautiful show car. But I actually have a lot more fun when someone comes in and says, I have 30 grand in kind of a shitbox car and I just want something I can like roll around with my friends on a Friday night and have fun that's mm-hmm. loud and fast. Cool. Let's do it. That like gets me excited. Mm-hmm. I'm pumped up, you know. So it's like your perspective changes a lot once you start like kind of analyzing yourself a little bit mm-hmm. and not filling those holes with things that aren't actually fulfilling. Um, I think that's something too Mm -hmm. people are missing a lot of like just knowing what's actually valuable in your life that's actually fulfilling you, Mm -hmm. not fulfilling you in the facade of what other people see, you know? No, and again, like the little bits of what I told you in my early 20s, where I was filling it with all these things, the car, the rims, the like I had 26 inch rims on my Escalade. Why? Cause I love the stuff and I thought it was awesome. But in that context of my headspace and where I was, I wasn't right with myself for yeah. why I was getting it. Yeah. Now, if I do, it's like, yeah, it's cause I want it. I don't need it. It doesn't define me. I just love it. It's like a passion or something that just adds to life. Yeah, exactly. Not escaping life. Yeah. Because like, what you were saying about the cars in the show SEMA and the racket about SEMA like I have a lot of buddies working (laughs) on cars and like man I gotta get this thing to SEMA yeah and then you get it there and they look great but when you really start looking under it sometimes those cars are just they look good on the outside the Bluetooth drive shaft is the the big one where cars will be in there but they don't actually run Mm -hmm. (laughs) because there's no drive shaft yeah um but you know I mean I've done SEMA now for 10 11 years um, and I've taken a lot of cars to SEMA for myself, for other companies, mm-hmm. uh, shops. This year, this last year, actually was the first year I brought my own babysitting win. Mm. Um, and I think uh, everyone was expecting, since I'm you know, a professional car builder, that I was going to show up with a $100,000 yeah. rebuild on my car. And uh, I didn't want to, though. I didn't want to because I said, but what is it really about? Mm -hmm. What is it really about? It's about people in the automotive community seeing something, getting inspired, going home to their project car and doing it, right? So all these brands that work with me, I said, look, I'm putting this car together. I want you to give me parts that are obviously top of the line parts. I want them to be affordable Mm. and not affordable like to the upper upper side of affordable. I said, I want affordable, like someone with their kid in their backyard could put it together. Mm. And I built my entire car that way. Um, And a lot of people were very confused by that when it showed up. Mm -hmm. But I said, look, it came back from paint and I I had nine days before SEMA to put it together. It was a shell. I had a bunch of my friends. 
I had a bunch of affordable parts. Mm -hmm. The build, generally speaking, was nothing. You know, there was nothing sticking out of the hood. There was nothing crazy. Mm -hmm. I said, but I made a beautiful car with people that I care about a lot that care about me. I did it in a way that someone could look at it and say, I could do that. I could totally do that. Mm -hmm. And that's what I wanted. I wanted people to see it and say, I'm going to finish my project that I didn't think that I mm -hmm. could because I am looking at that show car with no drive shaft in it um, <laughs> that took five years to build. With crazy body work. Mm -hmm. And I said, I just, I don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. Like even my paint guy was asking me about certain imperfections in the body. He goes, do you want to correct those? I go, no. I go, because I remember that was when I was 16 and it was raining and I drove my car off the curb because I couldn't see where the entrance was to mm -hmm. the the drive-in, right? I said, I don't want to fix it because those are memories to me mm. that when I see them, that's what I think about. Yeah. And so a lot of people were like, your car's not perfect and it's at a show that's meant for perfect. But I said, it is perfect. It's perfect because there's a bunch of people that saw it and are now going to go home and they're going to do it. And that means more to mm. me than showing up and kind of being like, look at me and all mm -hmm. my stuff, you know? No, you're showing attainability <laughs> and an unattainable very wealthy to do or big brand dollars world and like the next father daughter duo that wants to go build a car on the weekend they can do a it a little baby staying just like like they, they can, can do, do their exactly yeah and it, they can do it and they feel like they can do it now because they've actually seen it that's the thing and mm -hmm. that goes back to our earlier conversation being able to see something that is inspiring in a more relatable way mm -hmm. is life changing to a lot of people. And I don't think enough people take that to heart of like, especially people with big platforms and stuff. It's like you could show off your fancy house and your fancy cars and all this stuff. Why don't you show off your family mm -hmm. and the people that you care about or why you're why are you doing what you're doing? What's the end goal? Like what's the purpose, what's fulfilling you, mm -hmm. show, you know, the imperfections, the show. BTS. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's way more important and way more valuable and way more inspiring mm -hmm. to more people, you know? No, I agree. And that's exactly what it is. You know, sometimes we do these things and I get, you know, I'm careful with how I talk because I'm like, yeah, it's super easy to choose though. And I'm like, no, it's not. It's really hard to do this. Mm -hmm. And if I go on stage, like if I give you one line of my like i was in finance i did some work painted a mural i quit and now i did this like that's the super abbreviated version but you got to be careful because you can't just quit and do something like i tell people now it's like do you have a side hustle go see if you can earn with it go see if you really love it then start building it then go quit the career because you don't want to quit fail and run back to this and then never chase your dream again yeah so so how can you truly inspire so make it attainable make it palatable and like realistic but then show them like your biggest dreams are are available like and start here yeah i'm not saying start small but like start where you can start and, and just get started yeah yeah definitely just get started and realize like um how do I want to say this? That like you can go for all these things, but they're also going to take work. I think we like really downplay like those yeah. nine days before SEMA were my nightmare. It was awesome because I was doing something I'm really passionate about. I knew what my goal mm -hmm. was and it had great intention and I was really happy about mm -hmm. that. And I was surrounded by people that honestly love me more than I could even ask for. But it was a nightmare. It took a lot of hard mm -hmm. work. We were taking shifts, sleeping on the couch in the shop. Mm -hmm. Like, it's a lot of work. And I think people kind of, like, downplay that part of, like, it's all frilly. Go for your dreams. It's all happy. Like, it's going to be great. All this stuff. Yeah, it may be rough mm -hmm. struggles. But we don't actually talk about, like, no, you need to work, though. It takes a lot of work. Mm -hmm. And you have to, again, commit to putting in that work. Mm -hmm. And then it is going to be great. For as stressful as those nine days were and as much work and as exhausted I was, it was worth every lost hour of sleep, mm -hmm. every tear, every stressed out moment. It was completely worth it. But that doesn't mean that it didn't come with a lot of hard work. Yeah. And that right there is key. And we're going to end on that. It's, it's not like you flip the switch. It's done. It's enjoying the process, enjoying the journey. And looking back, the show, it will be a photo and a memory 
But what you're really going to remember is those nine days of work or mm-hmm. the years of effort or everything. And, you know, one day we're on our deadbeath. We're going to look back at everything. Are we going to remember the award or are we going to remember everything that led to it? Mm-hmm. Exactly. So final question for you. Okay. How do you define living a life through love? I think uh, living a life through love would be living your life with the purest intention to be the best that you can be, to love as genuinely as you can, um, and just always striving to be everything that you want to see in yourself. Mm. Yeah, well said. Thank you so much for, for coming out. Yeah. For joining us. <laughs> and where can everybody find you? Um, I am on Instagram at Constance underscore Nunes. Uh, I think I have Twitter, maybe. I'm not <laughs> sure. It might still be in existence. Um, and then carsbyconstance.com. Awesome. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for tuning in to Live Through Love. If you love this episode, you'll love this episode.